Okay, welcome everyone. We seem to have hit a steady state in the room. So I'm going to uh, introduce our fourth keynote speaker for the GLBio conference. I'm very excited to introduce Taki M, who's visiting us from the Lake Michigan region of the Great Lakes. More specifically, she's an assistant professor in genetic medicine at the University of Chicago. Uh, she spent at the University of Chicago receiving some very interesting and diverse training, has a background in physics and finance and math and all these great areas that uh, have maybe influenced her on her path to statistical genetics, where she's now a leader in the field. Uh, and I had done my homework and was prepared to tell you why we were so enthusiastic about inviting her to come here, about the impact her work has had. But if you've been at the conference in the last few days, people have been doing that for me already. So if you've seen GTEx being used in different talks, she's one of the uh, very important members of the GTEx consortium that has been profiling healthy human gene expression data that now spawns all these computational methods that people like us develop and use it to uh, make predictions and learn new things from this great resource. Uh, and also, for those of you who are in this session, the general track, uh, Paulo Coro just motivated using PredictScan to try to connect uh, genome-wide association studies looking at SNPs and genetic variation and transcriptional information and phenotypes. So I'm sure we'll hear about some of that in our talk today about leveraging large-scale genome and transcriptional information to understand biological traits and complex traits. So some really great resources, uh, wonderful publicly available nice websites to make information accessible so that you know, we can learn from these things. Uh, researchers who are more biologically oriented can learn from these resources. So uh, quite excited to let you take it away and tell us about some of these methods, resources, tools, and uh, biological insights. Thanks. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for uh, staying this late. I will try to be not too boring. <laughs> I know it's the last talk of the day. Uh, thank you, Sushmita, Bell, and everybody else for the wonderful organization and for inviting me to give the talk here. Uh, do you hear me all right in the back? This is working. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So the title is always, you know, I, they, people ask me the title and I could provide something. So uh, hopefully it's related to what I'm going to talk today. It's related to what I said I was going to talk. Um, okay. So I like to start with the acknowledgement slide because for some reason, I tend to forget about the acknowledgement slide, so I get it out there first. And, and it's important too, because you know, these are the people who contributed to everything I'm going to present today. Okay, a little bit of background. So as you probably know, in the last 15 years, we have had huge amount of progress in terms of like uh, how we are able to generate high throughput data, genomic, transcriptomic, images, physical activity, just to name a few. Uh, we can process you know, larger and larger amounts of data. And also, like there has been this kind of, the field has been getting together, agreeing on sharing openly a lot of the data in uh, you know, individual level, but also summary level data. So we have a huge amount of information, data available to us, computational power, so what can we do with this? So we can you know, propose like very ambitious goal, like the following. So we are going to try to characterize the phenotypic consequences of every human gene. So we're going to try to do that by integrating all this data that's available to us, genomic, transcriptomic, electronic health records from you know, biobanks like, such as UK Biobank, um, and other high dimensional data. So you know, typically what would one do if you want to find, you know, find out what's the function of a given gene, you would pick a, a model organism, like a mouse, for example, knock out the gene and see what are the phenotypes that the you know, organism has, and that will give us a sense of what's um, the function of the gene. So that's exactly what the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium is doing. They are producing and phenotyping knockout mouse slides for 20,000 genes. So this is an amazing resource that we will definitely be using in order to try to understand what's the function of every human gene. But of, of course, as we all know, mice are not human, and you know, experiments in humans are not possible. So there comes you know, the, what they call the human, um, the natural human knockout. So these are people with loss of function mutations in both copies of the gene, 
So these are natural experiments. These are people that are living out there in the wild, mostly happy. And you know, it's a matter of identifying these individuals and then measure their phenotype and try to see what's the function of having lost that gene. So as shown in the figure below, if a human has about 20,000 genes, we, uh, so the idea of this project is to collect many, many people, like maybe 100,000 individuals, sequence those individuals, and find, identify those few, it's, and it's typically um, a few, you know, handful of individuals that have complete knock, that are complete gene knockouts. And then, you know, this, we look at what happens, you know, what are their, you know, medical records and their phenotypes in order to understand the consequence of this. And in this era of CRISPR, it may be worth clarifying. And actually, I gave a similar talk in China recently, and I thought that there it was even more important to clarify that we're not talking about experimenting on humans. We're just talking about identifying these humans that are out there living and um, trying to uh, learn from them. So these uh, papers were now almost two years ago. So there was a lot of enthusiasm around this idea of the human uh, knockout. And you can see the enthusiasm in the titles that they came up with in Science and Nature. Um, you know, calls grow to tap the gold mine of human genetic knockouts, or the dawn of the human knockout project. You can even hear, you know, the 2001 you know, the <laughs> music. like. Uh, the human knockouts may reveal why some drugs fail, or human knockouts reveal genes that we don't need. So this sounds very good. So let's look a little bit more in detail what this means. So a human knockout project is the systematic effort to understand the consequence of the complete uh, disruption of every human gene. So the way I like to think about it is if there's a continuum of the function of a gene, so the knockouts are in that, you know, in this extreme where like they have zero copies, zero functional copies of a gene in their system. And, but the, these are like just a few, right? For a given gene, we'll have find only a handful of people that will be a knockout for that gene and the majority of the people will be here. So why waste all that information, right? Can we do something about that? So the idea is, you know, if we call these, the people here like partial knockdowns rather than knockouts, or if you come, come up with a better name than that, let me know. But I thought I was just doing some play with the words. So can we predict partial knockdown using genetic data? So what do people think? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You probably saw this picture. So we know a lot of many, many genes are heritable. So the, how much of the gene expression is heritable, it depends on the gene, but we know there is a genetically regular component. That means that we will be able to predict what's the level of the expression of a gene. So in essence, that will allow us to place different individuals in this continuum of gene expression level or function as we're calling it here. And this figure has been shown as well. So we have, you know, a, a genotype data matrix and then observed transcriptome uh, data. We call this type of um, data sets reference transcriptome data sets. Uh, we can train models and I don't need to go over that again. You probably heard about it already. So this method obviously will only work with, if we can predict well uh, gene expression levels. And we have seen that um, they can be predicted well well, it depends. So if genes that are highly heritable, genes whose expression levels are highly heritable were able to predict well, and genes that, uh, whose expression levels are not heritable, which are on this end, we don't predict well. So in what here I am showing is that the genes here are, have been ordered by their estimated heritability, so they're a component of genetic, uh, the, genetic the size of their genetic component. <coughs> And the red dots here are the predicted performance measures. So as uh, heritability goes up, the predicted performance measure goes up. So that gives us some hope that we can do this. And this is just to, to give you a sense of how well we can predict. And I'm cheating a little bit because I'm giving you examples on this end. You know, we don't want to just look at things that look like noise. Um, so this, for these four genes on the x-axis here, I'm showing the predicted expression on the y-axis, the actual expression, and you can see that we can do pretty well, at least for these genes that are highly heritable. 
So in conclusion, yes, we can predict the expression from genotype. So let's kind of, you know, I'm not doing the human knockout project. I don't have funding for that. But, you know, we can try to do this genome, uh, the human knockdown project, which would be a systematic effort to understand the consequence of partial disruption of every human gene using data that's already available to, to us in terms of in, in the form of GWAS, that GWAS results or to the GTEx results and things of that sort. So the idea is that we are going to do prediction using predicts kind of approach and we replace individuals in this continuum and try to, using that and their phenotypes, try to infer what is the function of every human gene. So here is a comparison of the two approaches. So if we do knockouts, you know, if you don't have any functional copy of the gene, obviously you expect large effect sizes. So you will see some consequences. And even if you don't see anything, that's kind of, you know, that's giving us also a lot of information about the, the gene. The, you know, downside is that we will have for each gene, we'll have only a few, because we have small sample size. So on the knockdown approach, we have the effect size will be small because the changes are small. But in, in, you know, to compensate for that, hopefully, we have much larger sample sizes. And then, you know, decontamination and co-regulation, these are things that I come back to um, in the second part of the talk. So uh, also for the knockout project, we need to sequence large number of individuals. For the knockdown, we can take advantage of what's already out there. We have millions of people that have been genotyped uh, for GWA studies. We have biobank data. We have half a million or a million individuals. So we can take advantage of all of that, all that information. And if there is sequence data, we can also use sequence data. So uh, one problem is the small effect sizes, right? So what do we do? How do we address the small effect sizes? Well, you know, the field has an answer to that. So we increase sample size. <laughs> but of course, with increased sample size comes like much bigger storage and computational costs. So the thing is we really need to, so we need to handle large amounts of um, many, many individuals data. So we need to come up with methods that are more scalable. And one popular approach is to use summary statistics from GWAS studies, for example. So instead of using the individual level data that are very uh, heavy, um, take up a lot of space, you, we um, try to develop methods that take advantage of the results of those studies. So for example, UK Biobank, the genotype data will be in the order of one terabyte or more, depending on what filtering you did. Uh, but the summary level data for, from a GWAS would be about 100 megabytes or something like that. And of course, there's also other advantages, like uh, privacy is not, not as big of a deal with summary statistics compared to individual level data. So this is something we did. And uh, so, uh, so we talked about predict scan, which is the basis, like the framework we're going to use to, in order to, uh, to characterize the function of genes. But the summary statistic version is as shown here. So let me go briefly over this. What we have here is in a GWAS typically, what you do is you fit your phenotype Y, which is this vector here, on uh, each one of the genotypes. So one column at a time of the genotype matrix. So this is actually the easiest thing you could think of doing. And amazingly, GWASs are very, very powerful and successful. So when you run this GWAS, you end up with this table of SNP level results, where each row is, has like the SNP, the effect size of the SNP, standard error, and p-value. And then um, in contrast, a predict scan approach will take the genotype matrix, will use our, the prediction model that we have uh, developed using uh, reference transcriptome data and turn the, uh, the, uh, the genotype matrix into the predicted expression matrix, uh, much smaller in size, and then run an association between the phenotype and each one of the predicted expression levels of genes. So at the end of the day, you, what you end up with is this table of gene level results where each row is a gene, and then you have effect size, standard error, and p-value. So the summary predict scan method that we developed goes directly from the SNP level result to the gene level result. 
So this is just one example where we, using summary statistics, uh, we can get pretty, um, you know, pretty much very similar results to having individual level data. And there are many people, I'm sure here in this audience, many of you are doing it, developing methods that uh, take advantage of these summary statistics. Uh, this is an ex um, uh, a comparison of how the individual level data C-score compares to the summary level data C-score. And you can see that the one-to-one, -one, uh, the points are pretty much on the one-to-one -one line, which means that we can use summary level data. You know, we, we are doing pretty well. And this is so much easier to run than you know, getting access to the large amount of individual level data running the GWAS and all that. Also GWAS uh, consortia, they spent a lot of time doing QC and all that. And when you use the summary level data, you're already kind of getting, you know, you get that for free. Um, another thing that is important here is that if we get the LD, the LD is a correlation between SNPs, right? So if here I used, uh, we used uh, 1000 genomes um, reference for the LD, but had we used the same reference as the GWAS study sample, this fit would be one to one, almost 100%. So um, the same way the field is sharing GWAS um, uh, results very openly now, and many uh, journals make that a mandatory thing in order to, to publish, we should also try to convince people that they should be sharing uh, LD information from the from the same day, uh, from the same study population. Okay, so you know, doing all of that, we build this pipeline that this was built with the version six of GTEx data. So we take the GTEx data, develop the prediction model using Elastic Net. This was chosen after many testing many different um, approaches, and then once we have the prediction model, we combine them with the GWAS results and put, plug them all in into our summary statistics, summary prediction calculator. Uh, we do one extra step that I'll be talking about a little bit later, and that goes into our database, uh, gene2pheno.org, that has, this is our kind of draft version of this catalog of the function of every human gene. So there's a lot more work to be done, but at least we have a first version. Uh, this is kind of a lot of people are, are using it, are interested in our results. I've seen papers, <coughs> sorry, uh, citing our results, and I feel a little bit bad because this is kind of, you know, it depends on me turning on and off the database and the citation. <laughs> so I will need to be funded in order to keep this up. But, you know, so that's why I'm saying there's a lot of work to be done. We want to make this fair in the sense that findable, you know, that. Um, I don't know, accessible, interoperable, and something else. Reproducible, or oh, I forgot now. So, okay. And this is a um, screenshot of what we have today, but you know, the goal is to uh, keep improving this um, database. Okay, so um, let me see. So I'll switch gears a little bit, although I'll be talking about pretty much the same thing, but kind of from a different perspective. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the analysis we're doing in GTEx in order to use the GTEx resources to understand what's the function of GWAS loci. So you probably, or you know, most of you probably know, the genome-wide association studies have been so successful but that NIH keeps funding them. <laughs> now we have, um, I don't know, uh, as of uh, September of last year, we had 25,000 distinct SNPs that are in the genome GWAS catalog uh, that are associated with some phenotype at p values at genome wide significance of 5 times 10 to the minus 8. So, the, you know, and the majority of these um, loci are not coding. So, then what is the mechanism that links the genetic variation with the phenotypic variation? A lot of us are working on that uh, in this room, probably. Um, so this is the working model that everybody kind of, you know, accepts, although some people there are uh, some loud voices that uh, scream against it, but it kind of this is the sort of the standard, right? The idea is that um, trait associated variants, so this GWAS loci, are affecting complex tra trait through the regulation either of the mRNA levels or the splicing of the gene. Um, and that could happen through changing, um, you know, uh, histone modifications effects on the chromatin. 
so while these ideas were emerging, um, this was about 10 years ago, uh, the NIH decided to fund this huge um, um, project called Genotype Tissue Expression, where the goal was to collect um, about 10, uh, no, a thousand individuals, uh, organ donors, and then collect 50 different, a little over 50 different uh, tissue sites uh, from these individuals. So after 10 years and hundreds of um, investigators involved in this, we have kind of this last uh, release has 17,000, a little over 17,000 tissue samples from 54 different <laughs> tissues from 838 donors. We have about 20 tissues per individual. Um, 49 of the tissues have passed the minimum uh, number of samples. So 73 samples is the smallest uh, sample size that was used for QTR mapping. Uh, we have mRNA seq data for all the samples and 30x uh, whole genome sequence data for all the individuals as well. So I'm going to show just a couple of results that are relevant for what I am doing, right? To try to understand what's the function of um, GWAS using these resources. So one thing that people already had published on, but maybe it wasn't in everybody's radar, is the allelic heterogeneity. So by that we mean that given a gene, we are finding more than one, so two or more independent uh, signals that are associated with the gene expression. So here, what I'm showing is um, on the x-axis is just uh, 49 different tissues, and on the y-axis is the proportion of genes at the different number of independent signals per gene. So, uh, and these are ordered by sample size. So as you can see, as sample size grows, the proportion of genes that have more than one independent EQTL associated with each gene goes up. So we can expect that as we increase sample size, this uh, trend will continue. So it's not that uh, having multiple, more than one EQTL is something special about the gene. It's just, you know, we were given the sample sizes we have, we were able to detect for those genes. Another thing that, um, you know, it used to be presented slightly different, but uh, we estimated the proportion of EQTLs. So EQTLs are these genetic variants that are associated with expression level of a given gene. Um, so we calculated the proportion, the pattern of sharing across tissues. So using this empirical based matrix factorization uh, method that was just published by the Matthew Stevens lab. So people from his lab, Gao Wang and um, a student, Yan Yu Liang, uh, they ran this um, factorization and they found this, I mean, this is actually part of the paper. Uh, it's not new, we just applied it to uh, GTEx, to the latest release of GTEx. And what we are finding is that the, the bottom here is the main factor. So the main factor, so these are different, all the tissues. So the main factor is pretty much the same weight for every uh, tissue. That means that the pattern, the most common pattern is the sharing across all tissues. So if an EQTL is active in one tissue, most likely it will be active, active in every other tissue. So that's the most common pattern. The second most common pattern is here, you cannot see the, the tissues, but these are all the brain regions. So the sec, um, about a little less than 20% of EQTLs that were found were uh, brain specific. And this guy here, this tissue here, is pituitary, which is also kind of close to the brain. This will have implications when we want to find, you know, causal tissues and things like that. Anyways, so how do we do to find causal genes? So can we find causal genes? So there are two types of methods that one would apply. So one family is what I call association type of methods. And in this family here, what we are doing is we have an EQTL that we know has an effect on the mRNA levels. And then using this relationship, we correlate, we use this as the um, exposure, and we correlate the, uh, the expression level with the phenotype. So methods that do these kinds of things are predict scan, SMR, or fusion, which uh, used to be called TWAS before. And then the other family of methods is co-localization. So co-localization is if you have a peak here for the phenotype, 
and then you look at the peak for the, uh, the expression level of a gene, if they are in the same place, then you know, they are co-localized, they are likely to be uh, related causally. So methods um, in this uh, category are co-loc, n-loc, e-caviar, sherlock, etc. So, okay. So now I'm going to talk a lot about the limitations of this method. It may become a little bit boring, but I think it's important to know that no, no single method, none of these methods are perfect. So, you know, we propose a combination of them. <laughs> so, association methods have the following two problems. One is what we call LD contamination. So this is the situation where you have one SNP that's causal for the expression level of a gene, a different SNP that's causal for the risk of a disease, let's say, but they are in higher D. So if they are in higher D and you run an association method, you are just going to get confused. There's, like, there's really no way around it. Um, so this is a, a known limitation that we, um, we, kinda, we have. I mean, there are ways in which we can reduce, mitigate the issue. For example, uh, Fusion or TWAS, they propose using BSLMM that has, in addition to the sparse component, it has the kind of polygenic background. That just induces more, that gives you more opportunities to get contaminated. So we do not recommend using BSLMM. For, so that's why elastic net or sparser models will do better. But still, even if you do it perfect, you will always be subject to this contamination. You may be subject to this contamination. And the other problem is the core regulation. So if you have a SNP that affects expression level of two different genes, and this is causal relationship, and then only one of them is affecting the risk of the disease, then using PredictScan, SMR, TWAS, or whatever, you, there's no way to distinguish between these genes. So this is a confounding that will only be kind of fixed by um, using um, uh, experiment, knocking down, actually knocking down the gene and see what are the phenotypic consequences. Um, okay. So here is an example so that you get a sense of uh, so let's say um, a GWAS person, right? You are interested in BMI or BCT, you run your GWAS and you get this peak. Like this is hugely significant, right? Because it was in UK Biobank. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it was UK Biobank. Okay, so then, you know, you are going to take the top signal, that's your most uh, likely um, causal variant, and then you're going to go to GTEx or any other uh, transcriptome data set um, and see whether there is, um, it's, this is, uh, this SNP is an EQTL for some gene. And if you come to the FTO, I mean, in this region, it happens to be in the, you know, this uh, region is in the intron of the FTO gene, uh, you're going to find that FTO uh, is associated, the level of expression of FTO is associated with your top um, hit in BMI. So your conclusion, which would make sense if you don't look at all this, is that um, B, uh, BMI, this, uh, this uh, variant is affecting BMI through regulation of FTO levels in muscle. Here I'm also showing you, kind of, we did one further, one step further, which is uh, fine mapping. So uh, if you run fine mapping, it's telling us the, the association of, um, of BMI here is kind of explained mostly by a few, like five different SNPs in this uh, region. And if you do the same with FTO expression level, you find that uh, the, these two SNPs, are explaining are kind of have posterior inclusion probability. That means that that means the probability of being causal of one. So you know, of probability of being causal of one seems pretty um, you know pretty significant or pretty reliable. So in this case, and this is the clear case of a negative control example because we know from many studies that actually it's not the FTO gene but a different gene that's farther away, like 500 KB away, the IRX3 and 5, and there's been a lot of uh, very uh, elegant experimental work that demonstrate the causality of that relationship. 
So we know this is FTO is not it, but if you are naively using this resource, you maybe get confused because of it's this LD contamination. So in looking at fine mapping and co-localization is important. And co-localization for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this can be thought of as you know, doing the fine mapping and then looking at whether the fine mapping of one is equal to the fine mapping. So the causal variant of one uh, of FTO or one of your trait is the same as the other one. Okay, so here is a positive control where sort one, and if you see that someone uh, has a method that works wonderfully with sort one, uh, well, be suspicious because sort one works well always. <laughs> so this is, um, I mean, that's good. If it doesn't work with sort one, I would be worried, but if it works with sort one, doesn't mean that the method uh, is, um, you know, at least pass some tests, but it's not, um, not it's highly convincing. So for sort one, um, so this SNP, the RS1274-0374, is known to be associated with LDL cholesterol and myocardial infarction. So that is suspected to be the causal variant. And if you do the fine mapping of the uh, sort one gene, you find that the posterior inclusion probability or the probability that this variant is causally associated with sort one expression level is one. So that's pretty good. So in this case, so, you know, after looking at this, you would think, well, why would one bother doing association methods if co-localization methods seem to be working much better and they don't have the LD contamination issue? But they will still have the um, co-regulation problem. But, well, the thing is co-localization method is not perfect either. And here are three methods. We spent a lot of time comparing all these methods. So coloc is the one that most people use because it's very easy, it's the most user-friendly. But it assumes that there's only one causal variant for a gene, so it ignores the allylic heterogeneity. And given the data we have, we don't think it makes sense to do that anymore. It also ignores the fact that the GWAS hit can have multiple, vari multiple causal variants in the same LD block. And then these guys are very sensitive to priors, so you probably don't want to hear all these details. Um, but since we spent many months, I'm kind of letting you know about it. So high sensitivity to priors, and I mean the priors, the most critical prior is the probability of a variant being a GWAS hit if we know that it's an EQTL hit. So e caviar, for example, thinks that that uh, assumes that that probability um, conditional probability is so that, that the events are independent. If you know a variant is an EQTL, causal EQTL, we know that it's more likely to be causal for the trait, but they ignore that part. So uh, because they ignore that part, if you compare with um, E caviar with any of the other methods, there's really no relationship. So these are three methods, published peer reviewed methods, and they give, you know, kind of very different results which gives you some pause on like how can we, how much can we rely on this. Coloc and NLOC, if you use the same priors, you, they have some correlation. Um, and NLOC, for example, uh, uses the data to estimate the prior, whereas Coloc gives you total freedom. So if you use the default, then you're going to be kind of too optimistic as well. So another negative result um, here, so we would expect height to be co-localized with height, right? So we have two different sources of height GWAS, and if we run a uh, fine mapping, we see that here, these are in this region, these three variants are considered to have posterior inclusion probability of one. So according to this, this is another fine mapping method, a very recent one from Matthew Stevens' lab, and we know it's saying that these three guys are you know, the causal variants. But if you go to giant uh, consortium data, it says, okay, this is the same, but it, instead of saying it's this one, it says it's this one. So now what we're finding is that um, you know, even the same phenotype we cannot co-localize. So that means that um, fine mapping results and as a consequence, the um, 
co-localization can be unreliable, it can be too stringent. So saying that this locus is not co-localized with this doesn't seem to be uh, fair. And the main issue is that, you know, yes, we have the summary results, but the reference LD, the correlation between SNPs are not um, right. So that's another reason why we should, you know, ask. I know this is like uh, preaching to the choir because we all make use of these uh, resources, but we should talk to journal editors, to other consortia members to, so that they really share uh, the LD data. If we really want to take full advantage of um, you know, their output, output, we really need the LD to be right. Okay, so here is another um, that's com comparing instead. Before it was just one region, this is genome-wide. So we have 10 million SNPs in this uh, rectangle that I'm not showing here. The rest are the ones that have some probability of being causal. So we have 1,600 SNPs here, 700 75 SNPs here, and you know, this is the same trait. And yet, the co localized, we would have liked to see something more in the diagonal, right? Or at least in this region, but most of the variants are either one meth, one in one data set, we think it's co localized, uh, it's um, these are the causal ones, in the other one, these are the causal ones, anyways. So take home message. So co-localization probability can be very underestimated. So as I said, you know, we have to um, scream to like data generator that we also, they also need to share the LD estimates to make these methods work uh, better. So it was maybe it was uh, like a lot of negative results that I shared. But uh, the general recommendation, given what we know so far, that the fact that most uh, methods are not, none of them are perfect. So, and this is what we published uh, last year. Um, and it's, you know, we should start with the association method that will narrow down the list of candidate causal genes, and then use co-localization method to filter out uh, LD contamination. But we have to be aware that we may be, you know, being too conservative and throwing away real signals. So, and so we should look at the fine mapping results and really kind of delve into the details of um, the results, but this is what we can do so far. Uh, we applied this uh, to um, GTEx data, to, you know, using the latest GTEx data, we selected 85 trades after uh, many phone calls. And uh, among those 785 traits, we had 5,467 GWAS significant, GWAS significant loci that were associated with some of the 85 traits. So what we did is um, we ran multi-scan, which is an aggregated, so a med, um, predict scan where we aggregate information across all tissues. So if we did that, um, out of the 5,500 5, uh, associated loci, we find a little over, a little less than half have some gene that are associated at the expression level. But if we also want that to be co-localized, it's only 1,700. So about one third of the GWAS significant loci, we can assign a function or gene that kind of you know, is likely to be causal. Uh, we did the same thing with splicing and the proportion is much smaller. So only 9% of the loci have a splicing event associated with a complex trait that is also co-localized. So we find more splicing events associated, predicted splicing events associated with complex trait, but the ones that are co-localized are much uh, smaller set, so only 500. So in the end, only 10%. So I think I'm just going to keep it uh, short. <laughs> um, I'll give time for uh, questions. So in conclusion, so I talked up, you know, we can leverage, we are leveraging GWAS and large transcriptome studies to start mapping the function of every human gene. And we have a first draft in gene2pheno.org that people, you can check and people are using as well. <laughs> We're trying to develop methods to understand the function of GWAS loci. You know, no method is perfect, as you probably suspected. 
So with the data we have, you know, with what we have learned after testing, comparing many different methods, we still think that the best way at the moment is to run an association. You can use Predictan, you can use any of the other methods that are out there. Uh, you, uh, after that, you filter out using LD contamination. So you filter out LD contamination suspects using call, some co-localization method. And we are trying to get better co-localization methods because the ones that are out there we feel are not, um, they, they either they, yeah, they need improvements. So that means more opportunities for method developers like um, many people here. And you know, if you use the co-localization, you have to be aware of the fact this, that these are very conservative. You may be just missing the signal completely. And again, I'm saying this again, GWAS results are being sh openly shared. This is wonderful for, you know, for science in general, but we really also need the LD uh, information if, you want, if we want to take full advantage. Yeah, that's it, I think, yeah. Um, thank you. We do have time for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, they should do better. We haven't directly tested. Yeah, so we know that if LD is wrong, we are going to get it wrong. Because if you see this, um, like P values, among all these, you have to decide which one is it, right? So if you get LD wrong, uh, it's kind of, it's obvious that you are not going to get the right causal variant. And I don't know how powerful these methods are based on individual level data. The developers tell me, when I show them this, they say, oh, it's because you have the wrong LD. So we have to test. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we looked at that a little bit. Um, so genes that have, uh, you know, that constraint, like the loss of function uh, mutation constraints, so they tend to have less loss of function mutations than you would expect, uh, given their size and all that. Th those tend to be less heritable. Also, there was a paper recently, a bioarchive preprint recently, saying that genes that have many enhancers, like uh, redundant enhancers, also tend to be uh, less heritable. Uh, yeah. But then probably like the treatment process and more uh, metabolism or uh, like maybe stuff, do we know if there is a treatment process? We haven't seen, you know, we did look a little bit, but we didn't spend a whole lot of time on that. We did not find anything obvious, but, you know, heritability measures are out there. We made them publicly available, so people are welcome to check if your gene set is more or less heritable. But definitely, genes that are constrained to not have um, um, mutations, loss of function mutations tend to be less hard. Okay, thank you. So can you tell how sensitive your results are, how reproducible they are across the study cohorts? Like, does it matter if your GWAS is very biased to particular geographic, geographic regions or demographic groups? So um, I think Heather's group has, um, I'll cover that, but what we find is that gene expression, like if we use Europeans to um, train the model, they perform best in European population. Uh, even out of samples, you lose um, performance, as you know one might expect. And if you go across population, you lose further. Um, so you know, if you use Europeans to train your models, the performance in Africans is kind of down. But if you compare it to polygenic risk scores, like the loss of performance, 
Uh, it's not as bad. So it's, it goes down, but it's, it's not as horrible as what you would get with a polygenic risk course of complex traits. which makes, makes me think that we are closer to the causal variant than with polygenic risk cause, with kind of complex traits. Well, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, hopefully everyone got the message that yeah, we, we should encourage LD. everyone to share the LD scores <laughs> with the GWAS studies. I was just <laughs> reflecting on your involvement with the gene expression studies and mm -hmm. VTEX. Is there any a similar take home message you might have as somebody who really understands that data so that when we think about modeling gene expression and gene regulation with GTEx, surprises in the data, things that maybe could have been there and aren't? Surprises. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. So that's the enhanced GTEx projects. It was like six or seven um, uh, grants that were funded. Um, so, you know, the problem with large consortia is that everything takes 10 times longer than you would like it to take. And they, they got funded, and it was three year funding. And by the time they decided, and they wanted everybody, all the eight grants should do the same samples, right? So methylation and, you know, and they couldn't agree on the sample. So by the time they agreed on the sample, they ran out of funding. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope there will be papers coming soon but it's much slower than one would like. Yeah, I would love to have access to that data. There's two different technologies with, for um, protein, um, proteomics uh, measurements, there's methylation. Telomere length is actually going pretty well. Um, we should hope to see results soon, but yeah. It will take time, and I'm looking forward for that too. And microRNAs were also measured. I don't know when we'll get access to that. 